Good morning. I'm Kevin Price. Delighted to be with you. Going to spend some time talking to you about you and your businesses. Your business has become, you know, really, I think, a, a good uh, student of our economy. Or you're going to be kind of a victim of what's happening out there. And, uh, you know, I think all of us, particularly since we live in a country that uh, that uh, we are able to be a source of influence through voting, uh, means we should be educated voters. And that's like why I like to bring people on like Brian Dimitrovic, he's an economist, uh, he's an economic historian, uh, a scholar, uh, and, and one of the leading authorities on supply side and free market economics. And as always, Brian, delighted to have you on the program. How are you, sir? I'm great, Kevin. How are you? Good. A little bit, uh, just for the listener uh, who's not familiar with you, you write a, a column for Forbes. Uh, you are chairman of the uh, history department over at Sam Houston State University. Uh, and uh, you you studied at some schools a lot of people will have heard of. Uh, where'd you get your uh, doctorate? I got my doctorate at Harvard and my undergraduate at Columbia, where Robert Mundell taught, who founded Supply Side Economics. There you go. Just don't tell uh, Arthur Laffer. But anyway, <laughs> and I know the two are actually uh, very cordial. But uh, but yeah, most uh, most of us, uh, most people uh, attribute it to Arthur Laffer. Uh, but he was really the great articulator rather than the great engineer. I think. Yeah, Arthur Laffer was a faculty member at the University of Chicago in the 1960s when he met uh, another young faculty member named Robert Mundell. And it was those two jointly who, in the late 60s, said, you know what, we need to restore the gold standard and we need to cut taxes. Nobody took their advice in the late 1960s, and the thanks we got was the stagflation decade of the 70s. Yeah. Reagan took their advice in 1981, the great 18-year boom. Yeah, absolutely, and it just it just goes to show that incentives do matter. Uh, we didn't really prepare in advance having you on, and you're one of those guys I could talk about anything uh, except for Houston weather and get some good answers uh, for. Uh, but uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, you know that uh, what's going on on the on the global perspective when it comes to taxes. I think it would surprise a lot of people to know uh, the United States is really no longer very competitive uh, when it comes to uh, our tax rates uh, compared to much of the world. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, we talk about the Laffer curve. I think the Laffer curve says you know when you really raise tax rates high, then government receipts from those tax rates will become very low. That's exactly what we see with the corporate tax rate in the United States at 35 percent, which on some measures is the largest in the world. And do you know that the revenues that are coming to the government are almost tiny? They're about one percent of GDP from that 35 percent tax rate. There are so many write-offs. And the corporations are gaming that. And if we just lowered that rate, we would have all sorts of new business in this country. And we're losing business overseas because of it. Yeah, no question about it. What's interesting is now is that uh, particularly the radical, the hard left, is talking more about, more about a global tax. Any country that's going to be in the U.N., for example, has to be taxed. And I think that's part of the uh, – that, that type of idea is being proposed because of the, um, the mobility of capital. Uh, if you tax, tax – you know, just ask the people up in Maryland how many of their highest earners they lost over the last decade when they decided to go after their tax top one uh, percent ask the people in new york ask rush limbaugh where he lives now versus where he lived a decade ago ask uh, the people who uh lived in england at the end of brown's uh uh time as prime minister of england and he left an incredibly excessive tax uh as one of his parting uh, gifts uh what happened to their highest income earners i think it's an effort to try to make it impossible for a capital to flee taxation the European Union in Brussels uses this very odd-sounding German word called Gleichstaltung, which they actually got from the 1930s in Nazi Germany. And Gleichstaltung means harmonization. Everyone within our union has to have the same policies, and by that they mean tax and regulatory policies. It is the dream of the bureaucratic left to impose that globally. Interesting, interesting. And, uh, you know, and again, capital, the idea of being capital can't escape if everyone has to take the same uh, tax code. Hey, they're, you know, they're not going to get it done. I mean, the world is much more innovative than governments. Um, yeah. So the one thing they're not going to be able to control is money. Now, we know they have not been able to regulate gold very effectively. Gold used to be illegal to hold. Now it's illegal again because of public pressure. Now there's Bitcoin. And we see the Fed's really trying to shut down Bitcoin through the strange Silk Road case and everything else. But that's not going to work. There will always be hedges against government policy, and you can start with money. Yeah, absolutely. So when you look at the whole um, 
sphere of areas that uh, that would be wise and smart for uh, countries to look on uh, look at it economically how would you prioritize prioritize it with you know taxes and monetary policy what areas uh, would you say uh, really need first attention well I think without question it's the old Eastern European countries that like to call themselves Central European countries Poland the Czech Republic Slovakia and the Baltic states they are the ones who have absorbed the supply-side lessons better than any countries around the globe, including now the United States. They have low and flat taxation, rates sometimes as low as 10%. Russia even did this for a long time. And what the Central Europeans do then is also try to outsource their monetary policy so that their currency is automatically convertible to the dollar. So the hope is that the United States manages the dollar well. We should act. They learn from us. They learn from Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher in the 1990s. Now it's time for us to learn from them. So how you know in the 1990s I had the opportunity to do a lot of speaking right after the fall of communism. I spoke a lot in different universities uh, in parla- and, and uh, members of, of Poland's parliament. So I like to take partial credit for what's happening out, uh, over there, Brian. But. Uh... <laughs> Hey, and by the way, they're the first ones to give it. They have statues of Ronald Reagan and Americans all over the place. So yes, the exactly ones. right. Yeah, I, I love the polls. The polls were awesome. Uh, they were of all the groups I spoke to. Uh, they were my favorite uh, to to speak to. But how are they doing? You know, I know that I hear that Hungary continues to kind of limp along, uh, but I hear good stories about Poland. Yeah, uh, Poland is just a, has become an economic dynamo. There's no question it's the strongest grower in Europe. And it's one of the reasons you never hear it. We always hear about Greece. We always hear about the suffering economies of Europe. You would think it would be news if there were an economy that were succeeding. Well, Poland is succeeding. I think the reason that the media is not reporting it is because they know the reasons are low taxes and sound money. Yeah, yeah, and that's interesting. Yeah, I saw an article at the Brookings Institute about how uh, how Poland was able to avoid a recession that has really pounded the rest of Europe. And of course, they look at at money tinkering central bank activity as a solution to that, rather than just common sense uh, economics. It, it's it's really amazing how hard people work to avoid the lessons of reality. Yeah, I I think in the last. Seven years, it would be news if there were a significant economic space in the world that avoided Great Recession or got out of it very quickly. It would seem to be the number one news story by rights in the world over the last seven years, and yet it's been held under a bushel basket. And again, I'm afraid we know why, because it would be a vindication of the great supply side revolution applied it, again. It really would, really would. Uh, can I hold you through the break? Sure. All right, Brian Dimitrovic. By the way, you can learn more about him. You just look up Brian Dimitrovic, Brian Dimitrovic at Forbes magazine. Uh, also, you can go to shsu.edu and uh, briandimitrovic.com. When we come back, we're going to talk about his big experience he's got planned for next year uh, that I'm excited about for him right here on The Price of Business. When I was young, so much younger. 